Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gary Morishima. I'm the um, U.S. co-chair of the Southern Coho uh, Technical Committee. I'm very pleased to welcome you to uh, the ninth PSC seminar in environmental change and Pacific salmon. We're trying to present views on the Pacific salmon and what it means to not only the species, but also the fisheries from both sides of the border. Today's seminar is going to deal with the topic of the Salish Sea, the Marine Survival Project. Um, the recording, the seminars are being recorded. The previous seminars are available on the YouTube from the uh, Pacific Salmon Commission. This particular session will also be recorded and available. Uh, we need your help in terms of organizing these uh, various seminars. We're trying to provide information that's going to be useful to the PSC family and helping to prepare for some of the challenges that we're facing in environmental change. But uh, John Field sent out a short survey uh, where we're trying to get some uh, feedback on things that you feel are most important or most relevant to your uh, discussions and deliberations. So this is a link. Uh, the form itself should be very simple to fill out. It should take you less than five minutes or so. Uh, so this will give you a little bit of an idea of, of what to expect in terms of uh, filling that out. Wanted to give you just a very brief history behind the, uh, the Salish Sea. The Salish Sea as an entity did not really exist until about 2010. Uh, prior to that time, the area encompassed by the Salish Sea, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, and the Strait of Georgia uh, were named separately. But during the 1970s, there was a substantial amount of interest in uh, shipping oil into Puget Sound. And it was recognized at that time that there was a lot of uh, potential for oil spills to uh, affect the ecological processes in all three areas. So at the urging of really the First Nations, um, I'll go back here, uh, at the urging of the First Nations and uh, tribes, who had made their homes here for many thousands of years and depended upon salmon, they knew that all things were really connected. And really it was at their urging and with the help of some of the scientists that the Salish Sea got its name in 2010. This little map on the uh, left-hand side of the screen just illustrates some of the language groups of uh, a number of the First Nations and tribes along the Salish Sea. Today's speakers, uh, we've got three speakers today uh, who are going to be giving their short presentations. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session uh, afterwards. Uh, please raise your hand. We're gonna have some people roaming the room that will uh, have microphones and you can raise your, ask your questions there. The next seminar in the series will be held on the 14th of February in Portland, and that's going to deal with the topic of uh, report up by the Committee on Scientific Cooperation. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to our three uh, presenters today. Um, Katie, Jacques, and Isabel. Uh, Katie is a tribal member. Uh, she's the fisheries director, a councilwoman, and subsistence fisherman for fisherwoman for the Stiligwamish tribe. Uh, she supports, supports her tribe by providing plans and policy recommendations for fisheries, habitat, water quality, and hatchery policy development and analysis to tribal resource uh, committees and staff. She's also a member of the Northwest Indian uh, Fisheries Commission. Jacques uh, grew up in Olympia. He has uh, degrees in zoology, oceanography, and marine science from the University of Washington. Louisiana State University and the University of Maryland. He's led uh, research projects in the deep sea and along three major US coastlines. And since 2010, he's been working with the long live the King staff. Uh, Isabel is the director of the Pacific Salmon Foundation's Marine Sam, uh, Science Program. She coordinated the Pacific Salmon Foundation's Salish Sea Marine Survival Project 
and is the manager of the Pacific Salmon Foundation, UBC, Strait of Georgia Data Center. She holds a first class degree in pure and applied biology from Oxford University, a master's in ecology from Dalhousie University, and a PhD in ecology from UBC. Uh, she also has taught at the San Diego State University and has been a postdoctoral fellow in ecosystem management at the Pacific Biological Station. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie, and she's going to share a few thoughts about the importance of uh, the Salish Sea to tribal communities. Good afternoon, my name is Katie. I come from the Sogwamish tribe in Washington state. And I've been asked here today to share a little bit about the importance of Salish sea salmon to tribal communities like my own. Given the fact that I only have roughly 20 minutes uh, and it's widely recognized that salmon are a keystone species in the Pacific Northwest, I'd like to set your expectations low right now. Um, whenever asked, many of my tribal elders say that salmon are a part of our identity. It's who we are as tribal people. And I'm confident I'm not the first person you've heard say that. But I've been asked to explain in a little bit more detail. And today I just really wanna expand a little bit on the parts of our identity and the ways of life that depend on our Salish Sea salmon. For millennia, tribal communities like my own have relied on these fish for more than just subsistence. They gave nearly every community member in our tribes a purpose, a value, and a way to participate and contribute. Whether it was making gill nets from cedar or nettle, or deploying those nets to harvest fish, preparing those fish, smoking, drying, storing them, everyone in our communities had a purpose and a goal. They were a staple in our year-round diet, whether they were fresh or stored or smoked, and they are considered a blessing for which we give thanks for each and every year. It's also said that the pace of our traditional daily lives was only ever hurried or rushed when fish were coming back up the river because that's when everyone needed to pitch in and help in a quick manner. All of our traditional stories, our religious ceremonies, our teachings, our funerals, our celebrations, they all revolve around salmon. Each and every year, my tribe holds a first salmon ceremony, typically in the springtime when we're able to harvest the first Chinook that's beginning its journey back up river to spawn. We've coexisted with these resources for thousands of years. They've taken care of us, and it's been our job to take care of them. They're inherently connected to our survival in multiple ways, whether it's mental, physical, spiritual, emotional. They're all part of our survival as Indian people. To give you an idea of just how important salmon resources are to indigenous communities throughout the Pacific Northwest, you don't have to look much further than our own treaties. When my ancestors signed the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855, they gave up a lot. But one of the few things that they insisted on writing down, despite not fully understanding or speaking the language, was the inherent right to continue taking fish at our usual and accustomed grounds and stations. It's written down. It's been 167 years since those papers were signed, and it's still an integral part of what my community tries and tries each and every year to continue to do. Since then, we've survived a lot of heinous assimilation tactics, but the worst by far has been the loss of our salmon resources. Since then, our survival has been truly challenged. In mental health, we're struggling with anxiety, depression, suicide. In the physical aspect, we're challenged with nutritional issues, heart disease, diabetes, substance abuse, overdoses, these are all things that plague Native American communities at a disproportionate rate. And it all stems from the fact that our culture has been chipped away at for the last 167 years. Whether it's through habitat degradation, water quality, quantity changes, predation, 
disease, human growth and development, and now climate change. There's a lot that goes into how these resources affect our traditions and our communities. While I'm sure I could draw on for an awfully long time about the doom that's facing these resources, I'm confident that you're all well aware. This isn't new. You've heard it all, I'm sure, many, many times before. And so often the work that we're doing is overshadowed by the problems that we're trying to address. It's easy to be overwhelmed by climate change and the impacts that salmon declines have faced us with. But it's my hope, however, that we can refocus on the central components of our traditional teachings. Because throughout all of it, I think Indigenous communities like mine have proven that we're resilient too. We have overcome a lot, and we've continued to thrive. Same as the, I think it's roughly a thousand salmon that make it back to my river each and every year. And I think that's why it's important to really focus and re reprioritize healthy salmon and the benefits and see that um, they're realized by more than just indigenous communities because I think if we, if we can focus on these salmon and recovering them to healthy levels, normal levels, we're going to have benefits that are going to be realized by more than just an ecosystem or an, a tribal community. Healthy habitat creates climate resilience. Clean water creates healthier animals, southern resident killer whales, and, and humans. And so by focusing at the bottom, I think those benefits really trickle all the way back up to the top as well, which is why projects like the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project is so important. The potential to really better understand the issues that we're facing and focus our priority actions with engagement from tribal pre people is refreshing and it's so necessary. In 2023, we've lost a lot, but I am encouraged by the work that we're doing and how we can all pull together to really realize some true and meaningful benefit. So without further ado, I'll hand the presentation off to Jacques and Isabel to explain further. Thank you. We're going to do this presentation as a tag team. We haven't done this before, so I'll ask your patience uh, as we dance around up here to try to make sure that we get all the slides presented properly. Um, I'll uh, say that the I'll skip the background information. If you want to understand about that, you can talk to me or Isabel afterwards, or you can go on the website and learn a little bit about it. I do have a summary report that's back on the back table there. If you like paper. You can pick this up. If you really want a copy of this and you don't get one, let me know. I have some cards back there and I'll send them to you. It's also available on, online at marinesurvivalproject.com. And so we have this, we have uh, a couple of auxiliary reports, and then we have the full 142 page synthesis report with the data and the analysis in there as well. Um, the reason why we launched this project is because about 10 years ago, um, no, let's see, it was 2009, so that's time flies. That was probably about 2008, 2009. Um, Pacific Salmon Foundation and Brian Riddle, the CEO, was thinking about um, what was going on with salmon in the environment, and there were a number of salmon managers who understood that marine survival for Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead, and also Sockeye in the Strait of Georgia, um, were declining compared to coastal stocks. Uh, marine survival, the, the survival from smolts to adult, the defense survival of smolts to adults um, was relatively high inside the Salish Sea uh, back in the 1960s and 70s. It declined precipitously, and so managers were trying to understand what was going on, but it was difficult to put together uh, the appropriate resources and focus to address this issue. Um, Long of the Kings and the Pacific Salmon Foundation eventually elected to join forces and try to put together an international project to study this. So today what Isabel and I are going to talk about is I'm going to give a brief overview of the program. Um, then Isabel, uh, who was one of the co-project manager with Michael Schmidt, is going to talk about how we did it, uh, what the results were of the study. And then a good half of our presentation is going to be about um, act actions that we are taking subsequently uh, with partners and um, uh, each one of our organizations and some future directions that we think we need to take. Um, so this was a really large undertaking. We had more than 150 researchers that were involved. 
Uh, there were over 60 organizations engaged in the effort. We raised $24 million in new funding and probably leveraged another $16 million in funding. So a total of about $40 million for the program. It lasted at least five years. There's some research that was still ongoing uh, before the synthesis was completed. And we were really trying to answer one question, and that was what was controlling marine survival, Chinook Coho, and Steelhead in the Salish Sea? Here's a picture of the principal folks that were involved in this. Uh, Brian and others, Dick, Dick Beamish and others came up with this idea on the Canadian side. Um, we came up with this idea of, uh, of trying to tackle this issue on the American side. We joined forces. Michael Schmidt, who's on the left here, is now the um, Regional Director for the Western Fisheries uh, Research Center for the USGS. Uh, uh, Iris Kemp on the far left uh, is now uh, the technical lead for the Green Duwamish River recovery effort. Brian is retired now for the second time, but I don't believe it that that's going to stick. And Isabella is, is going to speak later today. Um, this, as I mentioned, there were a lot of organizations involved, a lot of different sectors, pri uh, private industry, um, academic institutions, uh, state, local, provincial, uh, provincial and federal governments were engaged. And there were a lot of Indian tribes, at least in Washington, that uh, contributed directly to this research. Funding came from the federal agencies, NOAA, DFO, uh, the state of Washington was a, a large funding provider. The, the seed funding to get this started was provided by this organization, by the Pacific Salmon Commission. Larry Rutter was instrumental, I think, in driving that forward through the Southern Endowment Fund. And we're, uh, <clears throat> it would not have been possible without that seed funding. So um, what, what we tried to accomplish in this study was to, synthes to do a, a major investigation, synthesize the results, um, institute tools for recovery and forecasting as a result of that information, uh, develop long-term ecosystem assessment and modeling program, incorporate the findings into recovery actions and management, uh, test different solutions to marine survival, which is what I think we'll be talking about uh, further on in the talk, and then communicate those results broadly. Thanks a bunch, and thank you to everyone for coming today. It's been a long time talking in front of a room of people instead of a screen, actually, so this is pretty novel. Um, yeah, thank you, Gary, Katie, Jack, and obviously everyone from, for inviting us at PSC. So I'm just going to try to go pretty briefly through the how we did this. Um, so this is working on both sides of the border, wanting to develop a common framework. And the way we did that was to have a series of hypotheses that we developed right up front. There are about 23 of them, and those fit into these different categories and were tested sort of simultaneously on both sides of the border. Um, and all the work was simultaneous. It was a kind of a matter of everything at once, you know, trying to do all these things for several years at the same time. So the first group of um, hypotheses were these bottom-up hypotheses that something has changed in the environment, it's transmitting through you know, the water, the weather is impacting the water, climate change is impacting the water that's moving through the food web and basically impacting the amount or the availability or the quality or the timing of food available for salmon that are not able to grow enough and therefore don't survive very well. The second main hypothesis were in the top-down category was really around predation, just seeing this huge you know, increase in numbers of uh, harbor seals throughout the Salish Sea. Um, that was an obvious one that we would focus on. And then there was a whole bunch of other factors that are operating simultaneously that could be really compounding the problem uh, that we're seeing. And these were disease contaminants, how we're managing hatcheries and habitat loss. The cumulative effects, you know, we're trying to think on that scale, but realistically, we were looking at these hypotheses fairly separately at the time. What we hoped for was to be able to discern, you know, which of the issues are very local in scale, what things can we do something about, should that be predation or hatchery management or something like that, and which were much more global and really looking at those large scale sort of global regional climate impacts. And what do we do in that case will be more difficult, but you know, possibly there are ways that we can build resiliency in populations or help them be more adaptive to those circumstances. So just briefly on, you know, how we did this, we had a lot of scope once funds were raised to try and test things. I think that's the sort of positive uh, benefit of being two nonprofits that were running the program. 
And so we could test a bunch of different novel and you know innovative methods. Um, things that we ended up doing were pretty interesting, like using pit tag technologies to uh, look at different, um, compare cohort survival for different cohorts that were tagged at different periods of time, looking at their returns, comparing those to try to identify when are the critical mortality periods. Things like these seal beanies you may have heard of in the past that were really direct measures of seal predation. Uh, new genomic tools for fish health and, you know, a lot of different acoustic tagging or satellite methodologies or a whole bunch of things that we used. We tried to be really collaborative on the approaches that we used. And so protocols and methodologies and results were shared across border all the time. We had an inordinate number of meetings. And so trying to do things very similarly so we could take all those data at the end and actually compare apples with apples. So you know, collaborative approaches for a lot of the sort of plankton and the, the bottom up kind of sampling work that was being done, and then for the fish sampling themselves. So the troll surveys were occurring both sides of the border. And then also for ecosystem modeling, we were trying to do that on both sides and ultimately come back and compare these two different um, series of models that were being developed. We did align the uh, work that was done, uh, as mentioned, for the bottom-up work right through to the actual salmon sampling itself. So when you look at this picture, I just thought this was a really cool comparison. On the left-hand side, we've got the Persane and Puget Sound, and on the right side, our team in Cowichan Bay uh, in BC. And you know, it really looks like identical things are going on here. But when it came to some of the other studies, we were not necessarily duplicating on both sides of the border. Uh, that was really, you know, because there may be local issues that we wanted to address on one side or the other, or we had more capacity. And it also allowed us to sort of stretch our funds a little bit more. So most of the steelhead work took place down in Puget Sound, and most of the disease work um, was taking place on the BC side. So what we've learned, um, this was, it might be really impossible to read this right at the back, so I apologize, but this was kind of the graph for the, the sort of graphic that we put together from the entire project at the end. And the period that we were working in started here with fish coming out of fresh water. So that says rivers here. And then here is Salish Sea. So this sort of turquoisey pale blue color is the kind of chunk of the of the salmon life cycle that we were focused on for these these species and a lot of the work we did was using that pit tag technology that i mentioned earlier and by looking at these sort of relative survivals of these different cohorts of fish that were tagged at very different periods um, we could start to build this curve based on the sort of relative abundances of what came back and the relative mortalities occurring and when we did this, you know, the, the sense was that there is a very, very rapid drop off. So we really do have this sort of critical mortality period right off the bat when fish are coming out into the ocean. And then there is another period. This is sort of like basically the late summer fall period. And between there and over the winter, we get another serious decline. So you've sort of got an 80% drop in those first few weeks. And then there's another 90 plus percent of the fish that are lost in this period before they are actually even leaving the Salish Sea. And that really aligned with how when we started the project, what we thought that there would be these two really critical periods. When we looked at you know what were the causative sort of factors for the actual decline that had occurred in the 80s and persisted it was difficult to do in some cases because we just didn't have the long-term data sets to go that far back but what we did have was uh, you know a lot of information on sort of environmental changes we had oceanographic data and we had a lot of information on harbor seals and those two uh, causes of mortality really came up to the, the top. So we we had a transboundary synthesis group that really evaluated all the research at the end and rated, you know, where they felt uh, the most important factors were in the evidence that we had for that. And so food supply, basically that timing or availability, some issues have, have changed over time and fish may not be getting what they need to grow so that they can you know, evade predators in their first summer. They're not growing enough or storing enough fat to get through that first winter. That was one set of issues. And then the other was just you know, this 
huge um, number and increase in, in uh, seals and the impacts of those on these populations. So that's why these are in this dark red. These were the major factors. But you know, starting in freshwater all the way through this period, there are a whole bunch of other contributing factors. So there's no, you know, smoking gun here. This is death by a thousand cuts. And you know, starting with river flows, you know, the health of estuaries and a lot of the losses in estuary habitat, you know, hatcheries and just having these pulses of fish coming out that may be bringing in more predation impacts, um, contaminants, and basically disease. So a lot of different factors at play. So these are the factors that we ended up really focusing on, you know, throughout the throughout the program and where I'm going to just give a quick overview of our findings. So even though this was the marine survival project, you know, we're very aware that there will be carryover effects from freshwater. So a lot of our pit tagging work and, you know, lots of basic ecology work was done actually in freshwater. We did want to know, you know, what was happening in freshwater and whether those were, were things that we needed to be very concerned about. And when we did the pit tagging work in the Cowichan River, um, that started in, in freshwater. And some of those assessments were looking at hatchery fish, which typically would be trucked to the very top of the river and released there so that they had a long time to come down the river before they entered into the marine environment. And, um, you know, those, the belief was that there was no mortality of those fish during that period of time and that it would be beneficial because they would imprint to the river. But what we actually found was that you know, in years where there are very low flows, we could lose up to 80% of those fish before they even got to the, the river mouth. So that was a huge finding right off the bat. The hatcheries did change the location that they were releasing their fish. And I think this is something that we're just very aware of, just how low flows are going to continue to uh, become a problem with climate change. Um, so something that we wanted to think about for other systems too. We didn't know what the reason was, you know, for this huge loss. So a lot of studies were done with cameras and there were some pretty surprising things found out, like, you know, families of raccoons that were sort of working their way up, you know, side channels and just chowing down on on these uh, pit tagged fish, which would be full in their bellies. And then they would set off these arrays as they cross them. And we had no idea why the fish were moving the wrong way up the river. We just couldn't work it out until we put these cameras out. But one of the main uh, predators that we also hadn't expected were herons, and there are a lot of heron rookeries, and these herons were taking a lot of fish, and they don't like to forage in deep water, they like to be in about 15 centimeters depth, so they were taking quite a large number of these um, smolts that had been uh, tagged from the hatchery pit tags and, and very much in the low flow years. So, you know, this is something for us to have more concern about. We did also a lot of habitat work and just that riparian, you know, vegetation is so important and so crucial. And um, particularly we found that there are even species like Nootka Rose, which for some inordinate reason seem to house huge numbers of little Chinook underneath. So the other work down below here, I won't go through this because it's just going to be so hard to see at the back, but um, we did do some work looking at contaminants. This was focused on the Puget Sound side and pretty much showed that all the juveniles, um, juvenile Chinook in particular, from these urbanized systems are highly contaminated. And these are at levels in some systems that they will create adverse effects for the fish. And in the case of PCBs, which were banned in the late 70s, they're still around, you know, in our ecosystems. And they're still in products that were created before 1979. And they're in a lot of electrical products. So PCBs are still around. And so, you know, looking at PCBs, which is actually on the, the right-hand side of these circles, you see there's a lot of different systems in, in the sort of southern and central part of Puget Sound where there is a, a high a problem with the uh, fish health thresholds being exceeded for PCBs. But we also find that as the fish move out into the, the water, and what they would call in the studies, these offshore areas, they continue to um, take up PCBs. And at that point, when we're looking at resident fish in Puget Sound, they have PCBs at a level that is actually adverse to human health, which is really concerning. Um, for the PBDs, you know, it's not so problematic in as many systems. You see a lot more green on the left side, 
But in a couple of different systems, particularly the Snohomish, we are seeing uh, very high levels that are going to impact fish health for those. And these are basically flame retardants. So there is a lot of work ongoing to try to understand where are these flame retardants getting into these systems. Um, there's also the Puyallup, which probably doesn't show on this picture down here. Um, you know, are they coming out in wastewater and stormwater? And so Jacques will talk about some of that work after. Moving, I'm just sort of moving as the fish are moving. So into the estuaries, we did do a huge number of studies in estuaries. And I think those studies really clarified how important these are. I mean, we can lose a lot of fish in the river in these low flow years, but then, you know, some of the smaller fry for different populations really need healthy estuaries to rear. And in the more degraded estuaries, some of our studies did show that there is an actual, you know, 100% loss of that fly, fry component when we look at the returning adults if the estuary is degraded. Um, and, you know, so we know that they are providing food resources and shelter, as well as so many other benefits, these habitats. And uh, most of this work was taking place in BC, although there were existing many, many programs in Puget Sound. So we were just trying to create a bit of a focus in BC on this. Uh, when we start looking at the reasons, you know, for what's going on, what are the anthropogenic stresses and the climate stresses to these habitats, we see that there are so many different ones, whether it's log booming and, and what's falling into those environments and smothering uh, the benthos, uh, you know, anchor chain issues, lots and lots of marine debris concerns. And of course, you know, we've got other things like sea urchins have been proliferating and feeding on kelp, and they tend to do quite well in warm waters whereas kelp does not. As soon as it's over 17 degrees, they're just not reproducing and reproductive, uh, especially when it's the surface water, of course, where the reproductive bodies are, and it just becomes very warm. So we are very concerned about the kind of loss we're seeing in these, and we use things like drones and satellites to really get a handle on where and, you know, where are these losses, and I'll talk a little bit about the kind of work we're doing to focus on these habitats later. The big one was food supply and, you know, there's just so many different studies associated here. Um, you know, fish that grow well in their first year are the ones that do survive better. Uh, transitioning from, you know, sort of crustacean diet to a diet with fish, particularly herring, is very advantageous for fish. Those are the ones that will grow the fastest if they can switch to herring in that first summer. Um, so, you know, growth is related to what's there to eat and when it's available, and that does ultimately um, uh, result in survival, you know, positive survival outcomes. But we are seeing a lot of uh, changes, and the biggest one that came out were really climate impacts to timing. So basically seeing a lot of different mismatches that are occurring in prey availability. And this would happen with uh, some studies in Puget Sound showing that if crab uh, the crab life cycle is just pushed a little earlier, and there's just a one week difference, you know, for when the crab larvae are available to Chinook, that there are, you know, significant uh, detrimental benefits, uh, losses to the, the population. They just are not of a size that they can feed on, you know, at that time. And something very similar happens with herring throughout the Salish Sea. We've had a lot of contraction of herring spawning areas that we've lost some, you know, stock. So now instead of a January to June spawning of herring throughout the Salish Sea, we're really just in that sort of April period, April, and it's very contracted and spatial locations have been lost, uh, particularly in, um, in the Strait of Georgia side. So the herring that are available, you know, are basically of a certain size. And unless the Chinook can grow big enough, they are often not able to feed on these. So we're seeing a mismatch in, in size of herring, which is really a, a problematic outcome. Um, so I'm just gonna put all these up because I know I'm going slow, but throughout all of these, different, you know, pieces that I've talked to so far, climate is pervasive. So, you know, there have been some uh, modeling projects that are looking at what is happening with um, zooplankton, and there is a lot of marine survival. Um, Ian Perry did a lot of work with Coho and Chinook, just showing the, the importance of uh, zooplankton availability in total biomass. 
Um, but also salinity is really important and salinity is impacting zooplankton. And so, you know, these, these kind of models that are being created are starting to show us the, these pervasive impacts of climate at all these different stages of the life cycle. And, you know, the zooplankton there is super important. These are just depictions of some of the changes that we're seeing. So mentioned these kind of, you know, changes in actual flow rates, but also shifts in timing that we're seeing, you know, um, these are having impacts, obviously, uh, multiple impacts in freshwater, but then, you know, within our uh, near shore areas, sort of reducing salinity. And I think the salinity, I don't know, it seems to me that we think a lot about temperature changes in the ocean, but actually salinity is, is really crucial too. And it, it just keeps coming up in a lot of the, the projects. Increasing sunlight, you know, air and water temperatures, we've seen these reductions and changes in wind strength, which seem to be leading to earlier stratification within the Salish Sea and a tendency towards earlier blooms. And all of that just leads to all of these mismatch issues throughout the food web. And also changes then in nutrient entrainment and the whole kind of phytoplankton that's produced that fuels the food web. Into seals, um, this is, you know, a huge topic and I'm just going to be super brief on this. I mean, when we looked at the seal work, it's always a tricky one to do. You know, there's always so many things that people say, well, what about this? And are we missing this? You know, are, are seals just killing the, the juveniles and adults or the juveniles at least or sub-adults that would have died anyway, those that are less healthy? Or is this truly an additive loss? And so this, there's lots of questions about this, but you know, the modeling work that we have done for seals, I mean, there's a huge correlation in that soaring numbers of seals that has been seen at the time. We've seen declines in coho and chinook. And um, even though juvenile salmon may only make up three to 10% at certain times of the diet, just the sheer abundance of seals can result in a large impact. And so some of the modeling work that's been done through Ben Nelson and UBC and, and, and Puget Sound with Brandon Chasco suggests that, you know, we could be losing up to 50% or more of the coho juveniles. And, you know, it's lower numbers for um, Chinook, more around the 40% mark. And it's also lower for um, Puget Sound, where we have about half the number of seals and a lower density. But we do feel that they are having an impact. Uh, we do see some specialization. You know, we know that hatchery pulses come out and there are fish that become very specialized to those. Um, we know that they can become issues at barriers where fish are loading up, and, and Jacques will speak to this later, like bridges, places they can't get through, or river mouths. Um, but we have seen some linkages with forage fish, so at least with steelhead that really do get hammered by, by seals um, for the, from the work that was done in Puget Sound. Um, we have been able to show, or researchers that have done this work have shown that um, if there are a lot of anchovy around, it actually does result in lower predation impacts to steelhead. So we do feel that some of the kinds of recommendations coming out of this are involving, you know, making sure that we have healthy forage fish populations. I just wanted to mention this because it is sort of sitting here on its own, but, you know, when we were doing the pit tag work from the Cowichan and we were looking at what was coming back to the river, I don't want to get into the sort of details of this, but these are all different areas that fish are being pit tagged and then they're returning and we have a look at the differences between returns between hatchery and wild. And we saw that throughout, you know, wherever we're, we're pit tagging these fish and we're looking at what comes back later, we are seeing that it's survival of the hatchery fish is about a third as good as the wild fish. And this seems to be possibly happening over the first winter. So it's something that we don't really know what the reasons are. Um, I forgot to say that, you know, for the herons, for example, herons are mostly taking hatchery fish, but they're also a bit bigger at that point. So they're probably pretty easy to pick out, you know, in, in the rivers. Um, as these fish come out, they're bigger, or they're moving offshore more quickly. Maybe they just don't have that sort of physiological adaptation. Maybe they're just not as good at finding food, but you know, there's something going on with hatchery fish. And then disease is really sort of compounding all these issues. There's been a huge amount of work done through the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative, which was set up in 2013, and that was with Genome BC, DFO through Christy Miller's lab and PSF. And this was coming up with um, a lot of novel techniques, ways that we can have a look at what pathogens fish may be carrying, and we can actually localize those. We can identify new pathogens. 
and also work out where in the body are they, you know, where can we find them? What tissues are they, are they impacting? And, um, you know, really what we're doing is identifying these early disease states because we just don't find diseased fish swimming around or dying or floating on the top of the ocean. So this is a way to, to look at this. And Christie's group had started, you know, in, in hatcheries, agriculture facilities, freshwater, working right through the, the salmon life cycle. And now they've done work in the high seas program too. So they've been looking at, I, I don't know how many thousands, but probably about 36, 40,000 fish at this point. So it's a lot of sampling. And they did discover new viruses and then were able to do some follow-on work that's happened since SSMSP to really have a look at the relationship between some key pathogens in uh, Chinook in particular, and you know what the survival rates, what the impacts are on survival rates. And they do find pathogens associated with reduced marine survival and also individual condition. So they, they've been able to look at that. Um, and one of the interesting things is that the, this was only done in the Strait of Georgia, so we have a lot less information, you know, from Puget Sound for this work. But we do see that, you know, the Strait of Georgia, particularly in the summer, is a major hotspot of infection. And the Chinook that are there are picking up, far, have a much higher pathogen richness. They're picking up far more agents than we see on the West Coast. Um, and they also pick up more than coho um, and sockeye. So they seem to be, you know, not doing too great, but part of that might be that they sit in these defined rearing areas within the Strait of Georgia and they're just picking up whatever is in the water. Um, so yeah, this is de definitely a hotspot of infection. And um, some of the interesting pieces, you know, that have been pulled out from, from their studies, um, working with UBC and Scott Hinch's group is that we do see higher predation on sick fish. Um, but we don't know if and what that means, you know, does it just mean that you know, these sick fish are just going to be eaten or is it actually making, you know, things a lot worse. Um, and things are pointing again to this sort of changes in salinity as well as temperature with these pathogen loads. Probably had loads more things I wanted to say on that slide, but I just have to keep going. Um, I think I've sort of gone through this, but, you know, when the summaries were put together for the program, you know, climate change really comes out as this consistent theme. We've seen changes, you know, in freshwater productivity. We have cha changes occurring to the food supply, working through the food web. Ocean acidification and harmful algal blooms, we were considering these. They were hypotheses. We did look at harmful algae, but we didn't have the ability to... Um, do an awful lot with the data that we had at that point. And the committee basically said, these are probably not the things that created these declines, you know, in the eighties, but moving forward, they will be significant concerns. Um, these were just the reports that, um, that Jacques was mentioning. There is a really massive report, uh, that big one at the top, but he has put some way more readable ones that are just 21 pages at the back. And then we also had these reports that you can obtain all of these online. Um, one that really describes the approach, you know, all the background information, how we did this and the approach that we took. And then also, you know, sort of recommendations as well as descriptions of the kinds of novel approaches and monitoring that we did. Over to you. Good job. Um, You're going to get to see more of Isabel later. So um, anyway, so uh, that is uh, that is the the study that we did be completed. And now what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time here is what projects have um, been spawned or termed for from that work and what along with the Kings, the Pacific Salmon Foundation and our partners are doing related to marine survival now. Um, and so there's two ways to look at the solution sets for this. One is uh, if if the problems are driven by climate change, for example, and people are putting carbon at atoms in the atmosphere, and that's changing our climate and the timing of when when uh, rivers uh, freshets occur and when spring blooms occur in the ocean, we're limited to adapting to those. So if we have hatchery populations, we can maybe work with them to adjust their timing so that they match the new timing in the environment. Um, but if there are local impacts, like let's say um, contaminants in rivers, uh, predation that's occurring uh, because of man-made structures, there are some direct management steps that we can take. And so what you're going to see are a combination of different management strategies that we're trying to employ to test and see if they're effective. 
Um, for example, in this suite of things, the, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, along with partners, have developed a whole Strait of Georgia marine science program related to salmon. And they have a number of different tasks that you're going to hear about today. Long of the Kings has been working um, in Puget Sound region, looking at, at infrastructure projects and where infrastructure interferes with salmon migration, where it increases temperature of uh, lower river environments, um, or where it can block use of estuarine habitat. We're also have developed a report that is available to local um, salmon recovery bodies to, to show them how they can use the recommendations from this study to implement in their salmon recovery planning. You'll also hear about how we've instituted some salmon monitoring programs. Um, so uh, the recommended actions for freshwater is to look at predation. Um, Isabel mentioned that. I think there's work underway now uh, from PSF to look at predation of things like heron and other, other animals in rivers due to low uh, freshwater flows at critical times. Um, there, uh, there's assessment of hatchery practices ongoing in British Columbia, looking at, at the relationship between freshwater environment. Um, they're addressing uh, ecological flows. I'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, along with the Kings is looking at legacy uh, uh, contamination in our lower rivers. Um, we're also working on some stormwater projects and there's some work done on water temperature amelioration. So the Pacific Salmon Foundation has launched uh, sort of a parallel with the ending of the Marine Survival Project, a climate um, adaptation program for salmon in BC. Uh, they're looking at things like um, studying migration, barriers to migration of salmon through the Fraser River, including the uh, early returning Stewart River from Sockeye, and trying to evaluate what are the impacts and why are we seeing poor survival and, uh, and poor return of adults that enter the river to the spawning grounds. Uh, similarly, they're looking at forest fires with the increase of forest fire activity, both intensity and size and impacts, um, is, is there a tool set that can be developed for salmon managers to look at uh, in partnership with land managers after forest fires have occurred to decrease the impacts of those fires on salmon, juvenile adult salmon in rivers? Um, there's also some concern about freshwater refugia. Are these available? How are salmon using these? Where are they located? Um, and is there work that can be done to um, recharge those or protect those to make sure that they're available to salmon in the face of climate change? Um, along with the Kings has been working, uh, Isabel mentioned the problems with flame retardants in this Snohomish River estuary. So we've been working with the Washington Department of Ecology, uh, with the city of Everett to identify where the source is. It turns out that they are entering the river from the sewage treatment plant, but we don't, the Everett sewage treatment plant, but we don't know what the ultimate source is. And so we're working to try to track that back. Uh, but these are very, some really very high and harmful levels of the juvenile Chinook that have been found there. I mean, in addition to that, um, uh, we're looking for the, uh, the Department of Ecology and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife for looking at the, the uh, mechanisms for PCBs to get into the food web in Puget Sound. Um, I, there's work being done to assess contaminants in the Strait of Georgia, um, and uh, we're also working on some stormwater. Um, I, you've probably all heard about the, the sudden mortality problems with coho in urban streams where uh, the, the vector has been traced back to a component of tire dust that is causing uh, instant, instant mortality for uh, coho before they're able to spawn. We also have some concerns about that impact on juvenile Chinook, coho, and steelhead in urban freshwater systems, uh, particularly steelhead and coho that overwinter, that they may be impacted by um, tire dust as well. So we've been working with Cedar Grove and um, the Nisqually Indian tribe uh, to pilot a portable uh, filtration system that can be put in remote areas where you may have high traffic and high, high tire dust distribution, but you could, it's impractical to install a permanent stormwater system. Um, recommendations for estuaries. Uh, the, the work by Lance Campbell and Claiborne on survival, differential survival between um, small of uh, far out migrants and and fry out migrants is really important. And a lot of us have been talking about the importance of estuaries, but we haven't really had a smoking gun that says why, how, what's the mechanism, or at least what's the stage at which um, juvenile Chinook are impacted by loss of estuarine habitat. And the work that was done as part of the Marine Survival Project by folks at WDFW is critically important and has led us to decide that you know, estuary restoration is something that we should put a lot of effort into. 
Um, one of the projects that we're, there is a lot of work uh, going on, at least in Washington State, uh, in Puget Sound, through the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council to focus on estuary restoration, and it's one of the priorities of that work. I think the Pacific Salmon Commission, uh, the, through the Salmon Treaty, has also designated some work for lower rivers and some of our important Chinook streams. Along with the Kings has been working with a shipyard at the mouth of the Duwamish River, which is heavily industrialized, to see if uh, returning intertidal habitat in that environment can result in better outcomes for fish. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Isabel. So you can hold the pause until the very end. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, at PSF, we have a estuary initial program. So we're doing a lot of focus studies um, in estuaries, particularly trying to, um, you know, restore, protect these habitats. So some of the work that we're doing for eelgrass has been trying to prevent anchorages, like we looked at the anchor chain, you know, sloughing off the bottom in that picture earlier. So we've done some signage and actually some of this is uh, transboundary and these are just voluntary, you know, signs that are put out there, please don't anchor here. And then signs that can be on the, on the shoreline for people just to get an understanding of where is the eelgrass around here and what depths is it and why should I be anchoring or not and why is it important? Um, we're doing a lot of marine cleanup and um, we're also mapping, doing a lot of mapping work to just understand other anthropogenic stresses such as creosote pilings. These are all over the Salish Sea and you know they're really detrimental for herring law because herring will lay their eggs on these. There's something that's sitting there and they're very toxic. So the eggs either die or the they're very malformed when they hatch and they don't survive. So this is a problem. So there's been wrapping methods and efforts which work to some degree. There's been a lot of work looking at, at that sort of thing, but we, we're just trying to get these out of the water where we can at this point. Um, we're also for eelgrass concerned about, you know, these threats like the European green crab. So we're working with DFO to really spread a lot of information about this. And these are signs with our older logo, but these signs are all over uh, many regions around the Strait of Georgia, just to let folks know what a green crab looks like and how to report on it. And we may be doing some work just to try to, to get ahead of things and do a little bit of mash trapping for these moving forward. We also have a whole bunch of kelp programs. So a lot of this has been working with satellite methods to understand where kelp has been lost, to try to identify the sort of factors associated with that loss, but also to identify, you know, where are there resilient pockets of kelp? You know, maybe it gets knocked out with a marine heat wave, but it soon comes back. And what are the environmental conditions associated with that? Um, we're also doing work to, you know, identify along with that, but it, actually in a different lab at SFU, you know, which are thermal tolerant strains, you know, which ones will be most useful for restoration work. And the team at SFU in Cheryl Bisgrove's lab are also um, developing a biobank. And this has been a really significantly useful thing to do because we're losing kelp all the time. And so this allows us to take that genetic stock and actually store it long term. So they've come up with a cryopreservation, you know, method that seems very effective. And they are going to turn eventually to eelgrass as well, and other uh, marine algae. We're also looking uh, with another team, Kelp Rescue, through the Bamfield Group and UVic to um, use or look at different methods for restoration. You know, does something like green gravel work or not? You know, or should we just do more traditional ways to restore kelp? And what should be the genetic makeup that we use? Is it safe to just put all the same stock because they're the thermotolerant ones? Or should we be doing these really mixed stocks and learn from what we've done in forestry? So that's a bunch of the work in kelp. And then we also have um, a program called the Resilient Coast for Salmon program, which is funded through Environment, Environment and Climate Change Canada for five years. And this one is really aimed at, um, you know, educating and promoting and training people to build a lot more capacity and understanding of nature-based solutions for shoreline recovery. And um, so there's a whole bunch of different um, products from this, which are on the marine science website that are available. And I wish I'd remember to bring some because they've made some beautiful booklets. This is really aimed at the public so that they understand what are the detriments of having seawalls and you know what, are, what is the value of actually moving from the seawall situation and this hardened infrastructure 
to much more softened shorelines or soft shores or green shores has different names. And uh, the value of this is that, you know, one, this will encourage then your kelp, your eelgrass, the whole relationship with the shoreline becomes much uh, more able to deal with storm surge. It can also migrate upwards. So you have something that can actually move instead of a hard shoreline, you know, wall that just gets smashed. So this allows for habitat migration. And it does lead to us being able to create and maintain and protect, you know, um, habitats for forage fish, which as mentioned before, pretty important for us to do. Um, so this is ongoing on the East Coast, primarily of Vancouver Island. When we get to the food supply, you know, such a complex series of stories and, and data, it was quite the job trying to pull together all the different projects that we did um, for this when I, we were writing the synthesis report. But what really comes out from that is that we do need to have these long-term monitoring programs and they're not always the most exciting thing for funders to fund, but so, you know, so vital to us truly understanding, you know, what's going on in the ocean, how is that impacting zooplankton, what changes are we seeing with climate change? Um, and so these were sort of a bunch, I don't know if you can read them at the back, but it's all around different monitoring, uh, whether it's in the, the, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But anyway, this is a longer list of um, the plans and tools that we thought would be useful to try to maintain, and we're not doing them all, but I will speak to some of the things that we're trying to do on both sides of the border that we're actually funding ourselves, because the good thing about the whole program was that, you know, following it, some extensive surveys that had been implemented, for example, in the Strait of Georgia for zooplankton through DFO were continued. So nobody ever said stop. So they just carried on at these really high resolution zooplankton sampling, which is super useful. Um, so there are a lot of these kinds of surveys that are ongoing, you know, through DFO. On the PSF side, we did set up uh, a bunch of different um, monitoring programs. And one of these in particular is uh, called our Citizen Science Ocean Oceanographic Program. And that was for really understanding what's going on in the waters of the Strait of Georgia. And at different times, you know, we're, we have this ongoing collection of water quality data, but we have done work with Hakai to get ocean acidity um, data. We're doing a lot of work to collect harmful algae information and biotoxins in the in the strait. Um, you know, nutrients we collect all the time, forage, fish, work, and salmon diets. So there's a whole bunch of different kinds of monitoring that we are doing through PSF. And the value of any of these sort of community uh, driven, and that's what we have used for these programs, our community members. Um, generally as volunteers or sometimes as paid participants, particularly for boat-based surveys, which are quite a lot of work. So these are very valuable because even with payment, you know, to uh, it's not so much of a volunteer at that point, but even with a payment, they're still so much more cost-effective than sending out these huge, you know, vessels that, that typically occurs um, and can lead to very high sort of spatial and temporal resolution. So this is just a picture of our CTD. These are some of the sampling stations that we had 2019 to 2020. This oceanographic sampling has actually been ongoing since 2015. So we're moving into year nine, which I think is amazing that a nonprofit has actually supported all the way through for that length of time. And uh, we're really hoping we can get past the decade and really start to look at some of these changes. This is really our climate monitoring program for the Strait. And, uh, you know, was really able to track what was going on with the blob and how those impacts propagated into the Strait of Georgia and how that deep water was sort of retaining heat, you know, for longer than expected. So this is uh, quite good coverage. There's a little hole right under where it says Strait of Georgia, but that area is actually covered through the uh, ferries. And so there are the pieces that come together to, to make this a very complete uh, picture of the strait. Uh, we also do support some forage fish surveys. These are embryo surveys, but it allows us to understand where of our important forage fish like sandlands, which are very difficult to sample as sandlands in the ocean, you know, where are they spawning? And let's at least aim and work to try to protect those habitats so that we can actually not have them damaged or any, anything. Uh, happening on those those uh, shorelines to to stop that occurring. So this has been going on for quite a few years, and then the other sort of community citizen led.
program that we support is through the University of Victoria, and this is the adult salmon diet program, which was developed by Dr. Will Do Good. And this is like a, a really fantastic program because, again, it allows us to use the stomachs of, you know, coho and chinook that are caught at, by recreational fishers to get a real picture of the ecosystem and changes that are occurring. It gives us information about what's happening in the winter, which typically has been a hard time to, to study. And, um, you know, we could start looking at these forage fish trends. With respect to sort of juvenile uh, salmon and herring sampling, um, that was one of the recommendations to really continue, uh, you know, to make it very clear how important these, these mid-water um, trawl surveys are. And we have had the, you know, what's the word? The benefit of having the DFO trawl surveys happening since 1990. I mean, it's just great to have this really long-term data set and that is ongoing. But typically, we just go in now and then, you know, into Puget Sound. And so there was seen as huge value to, to duplicate something like uh, what, what originally was the Ricker survey up in BC. And so that is happening with Long Live the Kings, with um, Mike Krusin at Tulalip tribes. And they have set up this program and, and they will also be collecting carrying as far as I understand. Yeah. Um, but we have these programs um, already happening in Canada through DFO. I'm just going to put that up to get through. Um, so I talked quite a bit about the pit tagging work in the Coward Churn and how that really led to a lot of understanding of the relationship between flows and predation um, led mortality in river. And then our understanding of differences between hatchery and wild uh, fish uh, survival. And, you know, just being able to, to determine those critical mortality periods. And so when we finished that study, well, we didn't really finish it, but when we got to the end of the Salish Sea project and we were pulling everything together, it was suggested actually by our, our board at PSF that this be expanded to a, a lot more systems. So we have expanded it to about 10 other systems throughout the Strait of Georgia and, and one on the West Coast uh, with some funding um, through the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund. So this is ongoing. And basically, you know, we've had over 100,000 salmon that have been pit tagged in hatchery or in, in, in river. And again, trying to look at these comparisons where we can of the, the hatchery and wild fish, where are the bottlenecks to their survival. And uh, this is just the picture here showing these huge arrays that have been created, uh, you know, in river so that when the fish leave a system or when they return, we can pick them up and then compare survival of different differentially tagged cohorts. I just want to say one other thing on that one, which is that um, it said through the winter. I mean, we've seen that there's a winter period that's critical, but we don't have a lot happening in the winter. So the, the benefit of that is we've started a winter ecology project as part of that, where we have, you know, boats out in awful conditions, but really trying to understand what's going on with salmon. Uh, is this you? Yep. I think it is. <laughs> um, so... Uh... Along with the food supply, we talked about the importance of forage fish, and it's important not only for uh, food supply for juvenile Chinook and, some, and to some degree coho, but it's also an important uh, replacement food for predators. And when, when forage fish are abundant, we've seen, Isabel mentioned that we've seen um, reduced mortality of juvenile steelhead. So in, in British Columbia, they've been looking to try to understand the life history and the, and the population dynamics of uh, forage fish in the Strait of Georgia. In Puget Sound, we've been working with some tribal partners to uh, use what were uh, indigenous methods to harvest forage fish, putting evergreen boughs into the intertidal or subtidal habitat as a potential replacement for eelgrass and kelp for herring spawning. And so in the mouth of, in the Nisqually reach of Puget Sound and in Port Gamble Bay and Hood Canal, we've been using two different methods to deploy these and track to see if herring are spawning on them and if it's a useful, uh, a productive use of um, used Christmas trees and other evergreen sub substrates. Yeah. So predation, um, this is, a, this is a, a hot topic. As you can imagine, there's been a lot of discussion across the border about what to do about this. Um, and so as a result of the project, we've been working on uh, a number of different tasks. One is facilitating passage by barriers that seem to be pinch points or increasing predation. 
Um, another is to look at obst obstructing or removing uh, artificial haul out sites that may be making it easier for seals to prey on juvenile salmon in areas of high abundance, um, using predator deterrence like an acoustic startle device, um, supporting recovery of forage fish, as I just mentioned. And then lastly, uh, if none of these things work, we may have to look at um, active removal. In addition to that, um, we're interested in understanding, is there some interaction between changes in climate or changes in the environment and predation? Um, one of the things that we're, we're looking at is, um, does our management of hatcheries increase uh, predation impacts because we're releasing fish all at once and that's ringing a dinner bell essentially when they enter the marine environment or the lower river environment? Or does it actually offer a, a refuge from predation because you're flooding the system and the seals can't eat? Uh, eat all of them at once. Um, you know, is there uh, an interaction with climate change? And also, there's a lot of interest in tracking what's going on with bigs or transient killer whales. And are those increasing populations in the Strait of Georgia and Puget Sound going to have some direct impact and benefit juvenile salmon and other species migrating out of the sound by removing predators, harbor seals, harbor porpoises, sea lions, etc. They don't need a permit, so this is a if this is an outcome that we can establish. That's a desirable, desirable outcome. So um, one of the interesting projects is in the Strait of Georgia. There was a timber company that removed their their log booms uh, for a period of time due to was it COVID. That was referred to strike. Strike. One of the potential benefit of striking. Anyway, so these were removed, and while this happened. Um, Pacific Salmon Foundation and others were looking at the um, mortality rates for juvenile and adult salmon when the log booms weren't there and looking at them when they were there and are able to determine what the impact is. And so if it turns out that there's a there's a noticeable impact, can they work with the, the companies that manage these devices to see if there's a, an improvement? Um, Long of the Kings has engaged with a number of partners on a big project to look at the Hood Canal Bridge. For all of the rivers in Hood Canal downstream of the bridge, Juvenile sand, steelhead that are migrating out of the system are impacted by this. It turns out that the level of impacts through a couple of years of studies using acoustic tags and, and tracking uh, the survival of fish that have been tagged uh, indicates that about 50% of the fish are killed on an annual basis here. Now, if you think about that in the context of the survival of juvenile steelhead or ju yeah, juvenile steelhead coming out of the Snake River, through four lower Snake River dams and reservoirs and four lower Columbia River dams and reservoirs, the mortality rate is about equal. So this one structure is having an incredible impact. One of the issues that we've dis discovered is that the, the steelhead tend to get entrained in corner features on the bridge and they both get turned around and, and do not pass the bridge and swim back and forth. And they also get corralled in those corners by seals. So we are in the process of building a a 20 meter by 10 meter by five meter structure to float in there and see if we can short circuit that corner and have a one pass for the steelhead to get around that. If that's successful, we'll do another. And that was funded by the Washington State Legislature. Um, we've also been working with an organization called uh, the um, Oceans Initiative, Oce Oceans Initiative and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife on a device that's called an acoustic startle device that um, essentially bug seals and they stay away from the area where that's operating. And, and we've deployed that at the Whatcom Creek Hatchery and at the Ballard Locks to uh, pro help protect adult fish. And we're collecting the data on that. We've also implemented that at the mouth of the Nisqually River to try to protect juvenile steelhead. And so that work is ongoing. These are these are built in Scotland. They're, they're um, very hard to get a hold of, uh, but that work is underway. Oh, thanks. You're up. So it's just for two, you might as well stay there. Um, I realize that we're probably going to go over time, so I'm going to go quick on these. Just to say with the moving forward with disease and some of the recommendations, you know, that has led to the development of a salmon health program at, at PSF. And uh, they are working together with Christy Miller at DFO and continuing a lot of these studies. And so some of the, when we start thinking about hatchery fish and what's going on with those, can we release these in the best state of smolt readiness and health possible? So using some of these different diagnostic tools like fit chips, which are just a simple tool that can not, you know, 
not lethally sample a fish. So you can just take a bit of the gill tissue and determine if there are some gene expression that would show you that they are undergoing stress. And then you can see which fish are stressed. You can look at where they are and what those stresses and which genes are being impacted, you know, and what are the issues? Is it low, you know, DO or salinity issues or high temperatures, whatever it might be, or pathogens? And then they're also employing a lot of eDNA, which helps them pick up sort of debris that's in the marine environment. And then they can actually start looking at, you know, what's actually in the water and are there pathogens concentrated in certain areas? Where are these actually being found and pull these things together for a better understanding? Um, I will just mention this was the talk last, the last talk that you had at PSC. And um, Brian was discussing this hatchery review that we set up, and so I would suggest going there if you're interested, but we have been carrying out this hatchery uh, effectiveness review through PSF with these different key kind of goals, you know, what are the kinds of tools and genomic tools that we could use to really produce the, the best and the most ready, you know, smolts out of hatcheries. Um, can we look at really strategies on a very large scale? What has been done, you know, over this last 20 years and, and what worked and what worked where? And a lot of information has come out of both of these two. And now we're just completing the actual effectiveness piece. So we'll have to get this time. <laughs> um, so uh, that we, we did come up with some general recommendations for climate. Um, and one of the things that seems to be particularly important is the interaction between salmon life history and climate, both hatchery populations and wild populations. Can our salmon populations adjust to changes in the, the early marine environment to make sure that they're successful? Um, and we are also looking at things like um, modeling uh, in order to understand this better. As a part of this, um, Pacific Salmon Foundation, along with the Kings, um, the Washington Governor's Salmon Recovery Office, uh, um, Salmon Defense, which is a nonprofit organization working with Western Washington Treaty Tribes, and several researchers at the University of Washington are proposing that we initiate a salmon and climate initiative. This would be built on the model that we developed with the Marine Survival Project, uh, involving multiple uh, different sectors that are interested in salmon and trying to come up with an approach to articulate what are some of the challenges related to that. It's going to be collaborative. Um, we are really focusing on two issues here. One is life history, diversity, and how that interacts with clim uh, climate, both for wild populations and hatchery populations, and also um, factors in the freshwater that can be addressed, um, physical factors, freshwater flows, access to higher elevation, cooler habitats, um, how we treat riparian areas to make sure that water temperatures are maintained. And then there's sort of three outcomes that we would hope from that. One is to identify where we need more research. One is to identify pilot projects that we would like to test. And the third is to advance no-brainer major activities that we could push at a policy level to make sure that we improve survival of salmon. And the, the point is to restore um, and protect salmon in the face of climate change, which we're, gonna, we're all gonna be facing for a long period of time. Um, there has been some work already done uh, to look at salmon and climate that's underway now. Um, habitat restoration related to, to uh, climate population management and experimenting with various hatchery rearing. There is a hatchery coordination group made up of uh, the Tulalip tribe, the Nisqually tribe, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, along with the Kings and Pacific Salmon Foundation up here in Canada to look at adjusting release timing for fish to see if we can improve marine survival, re improve uh, adult returns, improve input to fisheries, and also increase uh, adult age and size at return. And so that work is underway. We're hopeful that that will be uh, successful. There's also some ecosystem modeling work that was initiated uh, in the Salish Sea. And, and we were we have some envy of the work that's done on the coast by NOAA and DFO to develop indicators for coho and Chinook returns. Nothing like that currently exists in the Salish Sea. And so we've been trying the monitoring work that we're doing uh, combined with modeling is trying to develop that kind. There's also a, a ecosystem funding program that has been developed to look at interactions between um, climate, uh, water quality, water temperatures that has been funded at, for a major ecosystem level model going forward by the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. A group of researchers has received $3 million for this work and that, that is following on some modeling tools that were developed in the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. Oh. Um, just 
following on from what Jacques was saying um, around the indicators, I just wanted to mention um, the Salmon Watersheds program at PSF. I think Katrina just had to leave, but this is Katrina's program and they have set up a program to uh, determine what would be the most appropriate sort of climate indicators. Those would be for both freshwater and marine. And then actually have a look at um, these vulnerability assessments and try to determine which CUs will be worse off than others and impacted by climate in the future. And then what could actually be done about that. And there's a whole bunch of products that will be coming, including a state of Pacific Salmon website that they will be setting up in tandem with their uh, Pacific Salmon Explorer. So questions for that would be for Katrina. I think she just had to run. Um, other recommendations, and this will be really quick, was really to have open data. So we set up the data center two years before the Salish Sea project even happened, and this is through PSF and UBC. And so this is a repository for all the data, you know, that we collected, at least on the Canadian side for the Strait of Georgia studies. And uh, the whole point of this is to have open data because data accessibility has been a problem. Um, and this is just one of the products at the data center is an atlas that we update every year with all of that oceanographic information that we have been collecting. And then the final set of recommendations were just, you know, let's just get this information out at all different levels. You know, we have to start with kids and really um, getting, I really enjoy a lot of this uh, kind of work. Um, it's incredibly hard to make complex things simple, you know, for audiences, but trying to do programming for kids, lots of videos we've been working on that are aimed at school age children, all the way up to a lot of these newsletters that we're creating out of our marine science program that are really aimed at capturing the science in a more readable way for, you know, building an informed, science informed public. And over to you for the Okay, so um, in, in the education sense, we've used the data that we collected by tagging steelhead to build a, a game that, that citizens can participate in, uh, where you track your steel, you have actual real data for steelhead and you track it as it leaves Puget Sound or the Hood Canal. Um, and it has grown in success to so this year we had over 100,000 students participate and over 25,000 non student participants so we're really starting to have some impact, unfortunately. In something like we did a survey, 68% of the schools that we are in, this is the only salmon education they're getting, which we think is inadequate, but um, it's better than nothing. Um, I am not going to belabor the, the summary recommendations. I think we've talked about this both in terms of the uh, findings of the report and also the work that we're doing. Um, I will say that there are a couple of recommendations that we feel are important to work on. One is to um, really focus on building resilience in terms of salmon diversity. I think this supports, you know, the work that's being done in the U.S. around ESA recovery, where that life history diversity is the basic principle of the whole exercise, but it may not be enough, and we should also be looking at our hatchery populations. The second thing is one of the recommendations that we had, and we even hosted a session at the 2016 Sailor Sea Ecosystem Conference, is to try to build um, a transboundary ecosystem science support network, and that is I think still under conversation, but it hasn't really been accomplished yet. So the last thing that um, we're gonna, we want to leave you with is um, you know, how does the commission want to engage with this work moving forward? I think that's critically important. What are your priority research questions? Um, what are the priority management questions that you have? And are there opportunities to scale up this approach for other questions in salmon? And I think that's it. Yes. I don't have the mic. I'm, I'm Roger Dunlop. I have a small amount of knowledge in oceanography. The first thing that strikes me from your bottom up approach is um, have you been able to dismiss deep water renewal through Wanda Juta as a driver of low nutrients? Because there's no nitrogen, there's no protein. And that's, you know, drives this thing. Have you been able to dismiss that? The other question is if you check those hatcheries. I can answer the second question. Um, that has that has been done for the facilities that we run. I don't know if that's universally done everywhere. Um, the first question: Do you have any insights into that, uh, Isabel? I don't think I've been able to take that out. Yeah. Um, could you look at the frequencies of deep water renewal and in that lake? Is when 
when that water pools up there, it's got to float down on its pick to climb and displace the water. We see that occasionally. And I don't think anyone's monitoring this. I asked Brian with Alvin, it's me off, but I think this is really important. And we got a thing that's like in the open ocean right now, when that Ala Klein and Zerum Klein are separating, there's no nitrogen mixing up into the sun when water's out there. And I see the same thing. If you if you send me an email, jwhite at lltk.org, I will forward with your question, I will forward it to the group that's doing the Salish Sea Ecosystem modeling right now, and we can share that as a as a resource. Thanks. I sponsored one of those fish that died in the bridge. <laughs> well, you learn you learn quick what's going on. Um, other questions. In the back. Yes, sir. I see in uh, Ontario you're talking about the fish are, the smokes are contaminated. Well, why is it there that you're not looking at the source of the pollution that's contaminating them? And uh, down on the Columbia, they're telling us now that we have to be careful. We can't consume as much fish as we do. That's my food source, it's always been. She said, it's the time we're born to the time we leave this world, that fish is part of the diet, daily diet. We eat it dried, fresh, canned, smoked, and the food consumption rate is very high in my family. So I didn't see anything in there about the source. Why are they polluting? Why are they contaminating? The cause of the pollution. Yeah, I can tell you for, for Puget Sound urbanized rivers, there's one project that we're working on looking at flame retardants and where they're coming from in, in Everett in the Snohomish River, which is uh, right in the middle of Everett. And it looks like it's coming out of the sewage treatment plant, but we don't know what how it's getting into the sewage treatment plant. So we are trying to identify that. That's just one place. The thing that I think is a bigger concern is is uh, is we didn't show an image. Maybe we actually we have the image of the contaminated older fish. I think we do. Uh, there, there, here. This graph on the left. Uh, no, we don't. Sorry. Um, what we what we have found is that is that as the fish get older, the Chinook get older, and Puget Sound. They, uh, the fish from all of the systems that are residing in Puget Sound have high concentrations of PCBs, which are not good for us. And they are at concentrations that are above human health thresholds. And that is, that is a harder question to answer because these are fish that come out of, out of um, more rural environments, like, like up on the Olympic Peninsula and up in North Puget Sound that don't have contaminants right in their uh, lower rivers. But those fish, as they spend time in Puget Sound, are getting exposed to harmful chemicals. And so how is that happening? Where, are, those, are there food items going into the urbanized estuaries where the contaminants are picking up those materials and then being eaten by salmon in the rest of Puget Sound? So that, I mean, I think you're identifying something we really need to work on, an important topic. And that is um, that we know that in these urbanized estuaries that the, the PCBs are in the mud, they're in the sediments, and that those are, at least in Tacoma, those are, are listed as Superfund sites. And so there is funding from EPA to clean that, quote, clean it up. Often the cleaning up consists of putting a cap over top of that mud and leaving it in place. Um, and that is may not be an hundred percent effective at keeping it out of the food web. So I think you've hit an important point and it's something worth looking at because not only is it bad for the fish, it's bad for people that eat fish and other animals that eat fish. Looks like we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, you know, do you have a like fish years or something? Have you guys worked with that, looking at that? Um, you say when they uh, walk through the ocean, 
because they're, they're growing in, in the river and they're being impacted by this. The issue lies in the hatchery fish releases, which of course we are directing. And so many of the fish now are, are hatchery fish now. And what we've done in general is just contract when we put those fish into the ocean. So you know now almost all the fish are very similar size and they're all going out around the third week of May. What used to be a much broader, you know, set of timing and sizes has has contracted down, and and that comes with a whole bunch of inherent problems, including lack of you know adaptive capacity for those fish. So that's really why you know Jack was showing that slide. This this concern about looking at other times and sizes and ways to release fish if we're dealing with hatchery fish to give them that chance to better line up with what's going on. Do you, um, do you have any information about changes in timing of when fish leave, release from the Salish Sea and go to sea as a result of the climate? Which was the first part of his question, I think. Yeah, but I think he was talking about hatchery fish. I think we, we do have information that it is getting earlier, and uh, we just don't have that many wild monitored populations to be able to definitively say that. But I know that John Moore's group has been looking at that. Hmm. Thank, thanks so much. Thank really, you. We okay. really appreciate it. Thank you all of you meeting. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Isabel, for today's presentation. And join us uh, in February in Portland for the next installment of our climate change and salmon uh, seminar series. So take care, everyone.